This is episode number 352 of the Inner Fight Podcast with Kyle Ruth. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Inner Fight Podcast and a big shout out to our show sponsors, Smith Street Paleo. Our offer is still on. Head over to iTunes, rate and review the podcast, and we will send you a goodie bag from Smith Street Paleo. Andre talks in this week's show with Kyle. No matter where you are in the world, enjoy the show. Let's jump right in. Welcome back to another episode of Inner Fight Podcast. This episode, we speak with Kyle Ruth, the head coach of Training Think Tank. Kyle, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing, Andre? I'm good, man. So for the listeners that don't know yet, Kyle Roof is uh, my coach and has been my coach ever since the end of the Open last this year where I didn't manage to qualify for the regionals and we've been working really close together to achieve that goal for next year. Kyle, um, he works together with Max, who is the owner of the Training Think Tank and we've had him on the show, which was podcast 296, where we spoke a lot about deloading, periodization, and general just CrossFit stuff. So if you haven't given that a listen, you should definitely go check that one out. Kyle, talk yeah, to Max us a little is, bit Max about... Max has always got great content, man. Yeah, man. He, he, it was a really, really good show. So I really encourage everyone to go hit that one. Tell us a bit about yourself, what you do, everything, basically. Andre, you're breaking up just a little bit. Can you repeat that? Yeah. So tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, what you do and who you work with, basically. Yeah, so uh, to give you an idea of my background, um, just from, from an athletic perspective, I started out as a, uh, a swimmer. I, I started to take it real seriously around the time I was uh, you know, 12 or 13 um, and pursued that as a, a career for a long time. I was uh, swam till I was 26 competitively, been to world championship trials here in the U.S., nationals, competed a bunch of times uh, against some of the best in the world, <laughs> and I, I – I took that basically as far as I could or as far as I thought I could. Um, and at the time I was like in the transition between athlete and coach in that sport. So in swimming, I was like, all right, it's about time for me to be done. I'm going to transition over to, you know, full time to coaching. And about that same time that I started transitioning, I found CrossFit, um, started competing in that. I mean, I was, I was 26 at the time, thought it was awesome. Got into it, ended up qualifying, <laughs> Ended up qualifying for regionals my first year. Um, back in, That was back in 2012. Oh, far and back in the day. Yeah, so it, a lot easier to qualify. They used to take 60 athletes. Um, it wasn't a super regional, right? I mean, it was just a very different sport. I think it was the second open that they'd ever run. And, I mean, the first workout was, was a seven-minute AMRAP of burpees, right? So <laughs> it, was, uh, it was an easier – qualification than it is now much different than you know the super regional qualifications where they take 20 people per region yeah um and, but that got me hooked i went there i competed as hard as i could i didn't have the capacity or endurance to be able to last through the weekend by the end of the second day i was wrecked and uh so i decided i was going to take it a lot more seriously dedicate more time to training yeah. you know really learn as much about the sport as i possibly could i bought a book on weightlifting i bought a book on rowing. I bought a book on running. I mean, I literally read everything that I could get my hands on, took as many different seminars as I possibly could. And just, I, I tried to immerse myself in the sport and fast forward a year later to 2013. Um, again, barely qualified out of the open, but ended up taking fourth at the, the mid Atlantic regional one spot out. Yeah. Um, and that again, just made me hungrier, hungrier, hungrier. Um, and at that time I ended up, so after that regional, I ended up hiring Max as, as my coach. He helped guide me to two more regional qualifications. Okay. Um, my last one being when I was 30. So I felt, uh, you know, I've, I, I've got, a. Uh, I just decided it was time to transition out of really high level competing and, and making the sacrifices that I needed to make. And I wanted to focus more time on passing on my experiences to my athletes. So that's where I've been at for the last, you know, two and a half, three years at this point. So my last regional was 15, it was 2015, the first super regional. Yeah. And it was tough, <laughs> uh, especially being at the older end of the uh, age bracket there. Yeah, um, 30 years old. Man. And that's, then that's basically a master soon. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I actually, I, I've talked a lot about that, about the idea of, of potentially, 
you know, retooling and, and competing in the master's division in, in two years. So that may be something that I, that I pursue. I don't know. Right now I'm really, really dedicated to helping my athletes become, you, you know, the best version of themselves that they possibly can. So I've, I've taken a lot of the time that I spent on myself with training, recovery, eating, and just poured that into my athletes. Yeah. Well, I see that with all the work you make me do and all the all the knowledge you pass on to me and what it seems that you pass on to the other athletes that you have. I mean, on, yeah. my, on my Instagram, yeah, that all the guys that follow that, that are coached by you, they all drop crazy good knowledge bumps, and I know where all of them comes from. Well, that's so, – so to give you an idea of what I'm doing from, from a coaching standpoint, what I do with Training Think Tank is I do remote coaching. Yeah. Obviously, you and I are not in the same place. No. Um, so – so what we're doing is, is, you know, this remote training program design, remote coaching. I like to look at it less as program design as, and more as, as actual like coaching. I try yeah. to, to take you as an athlete and it, you could probably attest to this to, uh, you know, changing the way you think, changing the way you live, changing the way that you perform to turn you into the athlete or turn you into the person that you want to be. Yeah. Um, and so I, I really do spend as much time trying to coach my athletes as possible. Um, and then the other thing that I'm involved in with training think tank is the development of our educational courses. We've got right now, we've got five educational courses. They're online modules that you can take, um, that just give you a, a sense of how we view training. We've got our 1.0, uh, courses out right now. We're working on our 2.0, yeah. which is really the third build out right now. We actually just started filming on Thursday. We've got a new format. Uh, that's cool for, for anybody who's taken an online course. This is going to be a completely different format. There's going to be myself, Max, Evan, all in the room at the same time, discussing the content as we go. So you're going to get the perspective of Max, who is a strength power athlete, he snatched well over 300 and, you know, at, at one point in his life, yeah. well, like last year. So he was, <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like definitely on the strength power end of the spectrum comes from a football wrestling MMA background. If you've ever seen a picture of that guy, you'll know that he's a big, strong dude. He's a bear. Yeah. He's a bear. Definitely. Um, so, so you've got his perspective coming in and then I come from a sprint swimming background. I swam, uh, the 50 freestyle, the hundred butterfly. My events lasted all of like 19 to 45 seconds. That was sort of like my, my energy system range. But I've also done, um, you know, long distance running, I've been successful in CrossFit. Yeah. I wasn't a 300 snatcher, but I was a 285 snatcher, and I had a 370 clean, so I was definitely not on the weak end of the spectrum, and I've built pretty good endurance. And then we've got Evan, who was an elite-level 800-meter runner. I mean, the guy's got like a he's, – he's been, I believe, sub-440 in a mile. I mean, we're talking about a true endurance athlete okay, here. Okay, wow. Um, and so we have all three of those perspectives coming in for, for each of our courses. And I think it's going to deliver something that people have not seen before because it's going to give you all aspects of training versus my bias or Max's bias or Evan's bias individually. But how's, how does it work? So you, you, buy the pro, you buy the course and then is there online tests or is it just watching a video or how, how does it work exactly? Yeah, so right now what we, we don't have uh, a certification program per se. That's something that we are definitely pursuing. But we want to get our 2.0 courses out before we start to go down the route of creating tests and things like that. Yeah. Right now it's a video – they're video-based courses. Yeah. Um, but they have additional materials that, that you get access to as soon as you uh, purchase the course. You know, we've got all the show notes and all that type of stuff that's included as well. So – it's a pretty comprehensive, pretty comprehensive course. Um, our current offerings are energy system training. So how do you build like the underlying, uh, capacity? We've got a strength systems course, which I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Um, an assessment course, how to take your athletes, assess them and design training programs based on their, um, their individual needs and the needs of their sport. We've got our X phys course, which is just a basic primer for people who don't have a background in exercise physiology. Um, and then we've got our movement course, which is by far our most dense. And that's about how to improve 
movement, which is a complex topic that includes everything from posture to technique to joint ranges to breathing. It's an extremely complex topic, but I think it's a six hour course. So wow. we do a pretty good treatment on, um, on movement. So that's what our current course offering is. And we're in the process of, of rebuilding all of those, upgrading the content, integrating some of the new stuff that we've learned. Um, and maybe we'll talk about some of that on the podcast. You see, yeah. Who knows? Yeah. So, so the main focus of this podcast is, um, is basically going to be talking about building an engine every year after the CrossFit open. I hear and hear from myself as well that we lack engine. We feel like our engine is bad. We're exhausted because of the engine. What is, how do you, would you define this term engine? Well, so the first thing I think we need to do is define it the way that the, the typical person would. So the typical CrossFitter gets done with the open and they're like, man, I was gassed <laughs> in every workout yeah. or in these, in, in 17.1 and 17.5, I was completely gassed. I could barely move. Yeah. Um, so I need to, imp- then what they say is I need to improve my engine. And I think most people think of that as, uh, they need to improve their capacity. They need to improve their, you know, if, if I do, if I improve my 2k row, I'm going to improve my engine. And it's not always as simple as that. No. Um, so uh, I've talked about this a little bit before on some of the other podcasts I've done and, and in some of the blog articles that I've written for the training think tank blog, but my view on engine is it's a little bit different. I look at it as kind of two separate layers, yeah. right? On the first layer, you've got your movement quality. How efficiently can you perform the movements that are required in the sport? Yeah. And then on the second layer, you have your actual capacity, your physiology. Um, and that's kind of like the underlying the, the underlying basis of, of what allows you to, to generate power. And so the way I look at it is it's an interaction between those two things and, and your ability to express your capacity in a workout is based on how well you move. Yeah. So I'm going to give you an example because I find, I, I personally find examples much more relatable than talking about sort of, you know, um, theoretical things. So, Perfect. uh, we take two athletes. So let's say we take a clone of you. So we okay. have two athletes that have the exact same physiology, except that instead of having the fantastic movement quality that you possess, um, this other athlete hasn't spent much time working on the way he squats, right? So he yeah. goes to his toes every time he goes into a squat, loads the quad, there's no hamstring loading. And then we have both of you guys do, um, we'll, we'll just use 17.5 for example. So both you guys, if we put you on a salt bike, we're going to hit two. Yeah. <laughs> we're, you guys are both going to hit 200, you know, 200 calories on an assault bike in a 10 minute test, yeah. right? You got great capacity, but athlete two, your clone who doesn't move very well, he's not going to be able to express that power that capacity in a movement like a thruster because his movement is inefficient so if we have you guys go he may be able to keep up with you for a little bit but he's going to be expending and wasting more energy in order to you know to maintain that squat pattern throughout the the workout and he's gonna in he's gonna get end up getting beat by you just because you move better even though you guys have the same level of conditioning yeah so so the way i look at it is You've got your conditioning and you've got your movement quality. And if you want to be successful in the sport, you have to, you have to train both and you have to figure out which one is your limiter. And what comes first? I, I don't think that there's necessarily one that does come first. If I had an athlete who just started CrossFit, who came, let's say they come out of, uh, or, you know, let's say it's a teen athlete. Cause yeah. I do work, I worked with a teen games athlete this past year. What did I do with her? Right. Because she doesn't have a background, right? There's no training okay. background. Well, I worked on. Number one, developing movement quality and developing all the skills for the sport. Yeah. Right. And so that means we worked on everything from building strength in squatting patterns to affecting her squatting pattern. How does she move so that it would actually translate to more efficient movement in the sport? And then we also built up her capacity. And then we did what I would call the combo of that, right? The middle, which is CrossFit. Um, 
And I think it just, it's, I look at it like an equalizer, like a sound bar equalizer, right? You, you turn up one, so you, you assess the athlete and you figure out that they're lacking in, in capacity or conditioning. Yeah. And they have pretty good movement quality. So you push up their capacity and conditioning so that they have a new ceiling. And then what you find is that they've got more capacity than they do movement quality. So they mm-hmm. can't express it. Then you pr- improve their movement quality. But then they're, now their ceiling is that their capacity is too low, so you push that up. And yeah. it's just this kind of back-and-forth balance. But you're always t- – it's important to note that – and you've probably seen this in your, um, in your training program. It's important to touch on all training qualities all year. It's just the emphasis is on a different spot. Yeah. So, so the whole periodization kind of system – can sort of work, but not really in CrossFit, or how, how do you think that works? I do think that periodization plays a role in this sport, um, but I look at the periodization scheme as more of like a, a guiding principle or like this overarching uh, theme for the training. So it's like we're in the, you know, we're in off season yeah. right now, for example. Well, you're not because we're, we're prepping for some qualifiers, but most athletes that are competitive. Um, who just finished the games or just finished regionals, they're in some form of off season. And so what that means to me is that we're, we're trying to focus more on their individual priorities at yeah. this time, whether that's movement, capacity, ergs, whatever the things that are specific to them that they need to develop, that's what we're focusing on. Yeah. But as we start to approach uh, c- competition phases, I, I shift them out of what I would call their individual priority phase to uh, competitive prep or a sport-specific priority phase where, where the goal is to address the needs of the sport rather than the individual's needs. And if you don't do that, you end up with athletes who are really good at their weaknesses. They've gotten better at their weaknesses, but they're not prepared for the chaos of the sport. Yeah, because I've, I've heard you talking several times about times about embracing the chaos of the sport and just how difficult it is and that it is almost impossible to create you know the perfect system or like those three months it's just pure strength and then you're gonna go into pure this and this and this like i've i've coached athletes like that i spent years uh i coached myself like that before i started working with max where i separated the training qualities we had awesome strength protocols and awesome endurance protocols. And I, I would put them together and we would run it. And then I would go do a, a, a tester. Or I would do a, a comp or a qualifier. And it's like, man, I feel like shit. Yeah. Like this, th- why isn't this working? I've, I've improved my cyclical metrics and my one RM is up and my 20 RM is up. All my indicators are that I should be improving. It's just that CrossFit puts all that shit into a blender and, just turns it on, you know, high speed. And so all of a sudden you're getting all these different, you know, fatigue signals coming at you at once. And if you don't have experience with that, you're not going to be able to express all that capacity and strength and movement quality that you did build up. Yeah, man. It's, I know from my own training, like the things you mentioned, like I could do whatever, 16 chest of bars in a minute for 10 minutes, but as soon as you throw it into a workout with some snatches, all of a sudden I'm down doing five reps at a time, not understanding what the hell is going on. And it's frustrating. For, yeah, and for, I think... Go. What I was going to say is I think there can be some some individual specialization you know, for that. So yeah. basically what, what one of the things I try and do is identify specific movement combos that athletes struggle with. This is something that actually Evan, Evan Pike, one of our coaches, he's really, he has talked about this for the last you know year and a half, yeah. is that one of the important things to do is to identify the specific combinations of movements, whether it's thruster double under or you know chest to bar and a power clean. Whatever those two movements, those two coupled movements cause people problems, it's just important to give them more experience with that and more exposure to that yeah. because there's it's training a chest bar independently and training a power clean independently doesn't necessarily add up to equal chest bar plus power clean no. in one workout. One in one in this sport is not two necessarily. Yeah. So it's super important that your program is extremely varied and 
that you as an athlete and as a coach figure out what the hell you need to work on and what you what scares you and what what you need to 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 address like yesterday or two days ago i mean we've been speaking about this a long time before as well doing a big testing phase but a couple of days ago you sent me a massive massive list of basically most movements that we could ever be exposed to in the sport of crossfit and you wanted me to address which movements that I fear or feel less comfortable with so that we could kind of work on those things. And, and I, really, I, I never really thought about doing that, which is completely stupid because you just – you train so hard every day. You go – you wait for the Open every year, and you probably have the same weakness every year even though you train super hard just because you don't yeah. specifically work on those combos or those movements. Yeah, and I think the more detailed you can get with that, the uh, the better it is. It's such an obvious thing, right? Write down everything that you can possibly think of that Castro could throw into uh, the open. Yeah. And, and don't be limited on your creativity. Write that list down. And if you haven't done a movement on that list in six months and you're prepping for a qualifier or the open or something like that, you should probably touch that movement, right? As soon as you know a dumbbell is an implement, you should be doing, you know, one arm overhead walking lunges, front rack walking lunges, two arm overhead walking lunges. Yeah. You should be doing dumbbell power cleans, sumo stance power cleans, clean and jerks, thrusters, squat clean thrusters, hang squat clean thrusters. Those things should be rotated through your program. And then what you need to do is identify which of those things you struggle with. Some yeah. of those will feel very natural. And some of them won't. And the ones that don't, you better make them feel natural. You better spend enough time working on them that, that they're comfortable because inevitably in this sport, you're going to fail where you lack experience. Yeah. Yeah, just because of like the movement library we have to be able to adapt to. I guess you can also say that the best athletes are the athletes that are fastest at adapting for new movements sort of thing. Do you agree yeah, with that? I think that's that's definitely a component of success in the sport. They also – we need athletes or, or to be successful in the sport, you need to both be able to adapt to new movements and be able to uh, develop high degrees of skill in the movements that you do repeat over and over. And I think those two are separate skills, but I think both of them are skills that can be learned. Yeah. How do you get better at learning new movements? Well, you practice learning new movements, right? Yeah. How do you get better at mastery, you know, at mastering a movement? Well, you work on mindful practice of the same movement over and over. So the sport and programming becomes a balance between um, what I what I would call structured variance. Structured variance. And <laughs> structured variants. Well, think about it. That's what I did with you. I gave yeah, you a yeah. list of movements and I said, identify what you need to work on. Yeah. Right. There's probably going to be a big list of like 25 things that you need to work on. So we're going to, we're going to create variants in that we're going to cycle through those 25 movements and we're going to address them in different ways so that we're not always approaching the problem from the same, from the same angle, but that's structured variants. But then you also have to have mindful, deep practice on the movements that you know are going to show up. Yeah. But I tend to do that more with pattern-based stuff. We know that a squat pattern is going to show up. We know that a single leg pattern is going to show up. We know that a bending pattern is going to show up. Yeah. So we develop mindful practice in those patterns with different foot stances and bar loading and dumbbell loading and sandbag loading and just give you as much experience as possible so that whatever does show up, you're in some way, shape, or form prepared for it. But there has to be some sort of progression towards – that's what I was talking about with the periodization. There has to be sort of this overarching theme, and that's based on the, indiv the individual's needs, on yeah. your priorities. The, the job as a coach and, and programmer and remote coaching, whatever we can call it, is such a challenging thing in a sport like CrossFit because systems yeah, have I was, to change every year. When I was a full-time athlete, the amount of time that I put into coaching was – was I, I was creating programs based on my experience. Yeah. And now that I am full time coaching and that's and, and that's what I'm dedicating all my time to and just training as my my training has become an exploration tool to find better methods to upgrade my athletes training programs. Yeah. 
not to not to keep myself in better shape or anything like that. And so what I'm constantly trying to do in my own training is like push the push the boundaries of, of my own knowledge so that I can pass that stuff back on to you guys and upgrade your training systems. Yeah. And the other thing I think is that when I first started coaching, I've been coaching for 11 years. I started strength and conditioning coaching when I was 21. I'm 32 now. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, it, it doesn't feel like that long. Um, I feel like I've been <laughs> coaching for just a couple of years, but I was very systematic when I started. I think I was, I think I would say that I was very not dogmatic because I was open to incorporating new styles of training, but I was very systematic okay. um, about testing things because I wanted to see how things worked. And the further I've gotten into coaching, and this is a chaotic sport, so it kind of makes sense, but the less systematic I've become about how I approach things, except that I would call it a system, a systematized chaos or, or something along those lines where it's not I know random. the direction. It's the difference between yeah. being random and actually having a bit of a system. Yeah, I have a much bigger toolbox than I've ever had before. So there's So if I have a problem and – the current tool that I'm using isn't solving it. Well, then I can come at it at a, for, you know, from a different angle. Yeah. Let's um let's dive a little bit into the energy systems and if you can sort of put your athletes into different categories of what is the limitations in their energy systems. Yeah. I okay. So to preface this, this is very important. So whenever we try to take like a complex thing like an athlete's energy systems and and reduce it down to its basic components like you are uh an anaerobic athlete or you are an aerobic athlete we're always missing the fact that that it's all just a sort of gradient yeah. right that everyone exists on this kind of continuum from super powerful all the way down to super endurance or i shouldn't say down all the way over to super enduring because i don't want to look down on endurance athletes no, no. um I, I just participated in that that long run, that t- 10K run plus 2K kayak. Uh, I have so much respect for, for endurance athletes. Uh, that's the second time I've done something like that. Every time I get done and I'm humbled. But, um, yeah, so the way I look at it is like this. The thing that fails the, during a hard test can be one of three things. Um, and again, I don't want to, I, I don't want to say that these are like hard and fast categories. So just keep that in mind as you hear these, yeah. um, your delivery system, right? So the, your ability to deliver oxygen and blood to the tissues that can be a choke point, um, for athletes that who, who struggle with that, I call them cardiac limited athletes. And, yeah. um, again, Evan came up with a lot of this terminology. I don't want to take credit for it. So he took systems that existed and upgraded upgraded them so i I just want to make sure i give credit to evan where where credit is due um but so you have your delivery limited athletes their problem is when they get you know halfway into a workout their heart isn't strong enough to deliver the blood and oxygen to the working muscle and that's what starts to slow them down when that happens they start to use up all the oxygen that's in the muscle it starts to, to build up some lactate. It starts to slow them down. They get fatigued. The, you know, the nervous system can't, can't replenish ATP fast enough because the muscle is becoming more acidic. And boom, right? There's, yeah. your, there's your fatigue point. There's your red line. Then we have uh, what I would call utilization okay. limited athletes. So like their problem is their local aerobic capacity of the tissue that's being used. And the best example of this is if you take – someone who's never been on a ski erg, like take someone who's an awesome rower and you put them on the ski erg for the first time ever. And you're like, all right, uh, we're going to do a 30 minute, 30 minute ski time trial, three, two, one, go, right. Their lats and shoulders are going to blow up. Why? Yeah. Cause they haven't built the capillary network, like the blood vessel network. And they haven't built the mitochondrial network that are necessary to extract all that oxygen out of the blood. Those are utilization limited athletes. Um, which tend to be untrained athletes or people who have never had exposure to whatever exercise they're doing. Yeah. Um, and then you have this unique category that we call respiratory limited athletes. And these athletes, um, they're not their their cardiac system is efficient enough, and their local utilization is efficient enough that the choke point becomes their ability to pick up 
oxygen from the lungs or essentially to ventilate enough oxygen to keep their blood oxygenated. And yeah. that becomes their limitation. Um, this, it, it stimulates what's called the metabo-reflex, which basically pulls blood away from all of the extremities, right? So they'll be going and they hit what we would call like their respiratory threshold or respiratory breakpoint, and this metabo-reflex kicks in and they suck all the blood away from their legs, <laughs> from their arms, and they give it to their brain and their diaphragm to make it so that they can keep breathing because if you stop breathing, well, you die, Yeah. right? So it's a survival mechanism, but... Those athletes, they've developed their their local utilization and their their delivery systems to the point that, you know, they're extremely powerful. They just they have a, a different limiter. And so, what we try and do is identify where an athlete falls on that continuum. Um, much easier to do with you know a muscle oxygen sensor or something like that. But which is the uh, Moxie one, monitor, right? The the Moxie monitor. We yep. need to and talk about that thing. afterwards as well, as well. Yeah, we we definitely will. And and I just. I, I just started looking into this other one, this BSX Insight. They now have uh, SMO2, which is local oxygen saturation, and THB, total hemoglobin, which are the two major components for determining people's um, limiter between is it their delivery systems, is it their local utilization, or is it their um, respiratory system, you know, their ability to, uh, to pick up oxygen. So, yeah. yes, yes, to circle back to your question, yes, athletes can be categorized uh, based on their energy system limitations, um, but it's it can be difficult to do if you don't have experience and you don't have a muscle oxygen sensor. However, Evan and I have talked about this. He's been using the Moxie monitor for a year, and okay. between him, Max, and I, we've been 100% accurate in identifying someone's limiter before they test. So we'll talk beforehand based okay. on our experience with an athlete, and then we test them, and we're like, yep, it was we were correct. It, at the beginning and basically athletes that are bigger, thicker and very hypertrophied, they got a lot of muscle mass. They tend to be the ones that are cardiac limited or delivery limited. It makes sense. They've got a lot more muscle tissue to try and to have to deliver blood to. Yeah. And their heart probably hasn't, their heart hasn't grown while they were developing all that muscle mass. So those athletes tend to be delivery limited. Your smaller, more enduring athletes who tend to be tend to be a little bit less powerful. They typically have your respiratory limitations, and then your untrained athletes are the ones with the local utilization problems. Okay, so those three categories. That's yeah. where you would divide your sort of athletes in. Could you have a mix of all three? Could you? Have yeah, a- everybody. Ha- everybody has every limiter. Yeah. So, for example, you're not an experienced swimmer. So, if I throw you in in a long open water swim, what's your choke point going to be? Is it going to be breathing and, and heart rate, or is it going to be that your lats and shoulders are so blown up you can barely take another stroke? Lats and shoulders, probably. But if we put you on a true form or an assault bike or a rower or a Metcon, yeah. that's not the same. It, no. It's not the same limiter. So it really depends on what, what environment you're thrown in and how experienced you're in it as well. Yeah, and the other the other thing that can get really confusing is a lot of times the the limiter that you feel is not. The thing that you feel is not actually the limiter. It's yeah. the thing that's compensating for the limiter. So, for example, for, for me, um, I'm definitely a cardiac or delivery limited athlete. But a lot of times I'll be in a workout and I feel like I'm out of breath and I can't catch my breath. Well, yeah. why? Because my respiratory system is trying to compensate for my lack of cardiac output. Yeah. Right? So the same thing <laughs> can happen for you. You might be in a workout and feel like your heart rate is, is never coming down. Your heart rate's too high. That's because your cardiac system is trying to compensate for the lack of oxygen that you're picking up from your 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 lungs. Yeah, makes good sense. It's confusing. Yeah, it's confusing. It's confusing, <laughs> but I, I think with the good examples, it, it makes it a little bit more comprehensible. Let's yeah. um, let's talk so, about the moxie. So this is r- real quick. That's okay. the paradigm that we're laying out in um, in our energy system course is how to identify and train and integrate energy system training into someone's program in order to address their specific limiters. Yeah. So if you're an open athlete, regional athlete, or whoever you are out there and you need to address your weaknesses, definitely get on top of that online course to figure out what exactly you need to do to be ready for whatever you have coming in your future. 
Or, or you could do what I did in my career and just keep beating your head on the wall over and over and over and never really getting better at the things that, that limited you in, until you meet Evan three, you know, two years after you retire and it's like, oh, okay, that's what I was doing wrong. Now I, now I see. <laughs> yeah. So even if you're a coach or an amazing athlete, would you say that having a coach is a necessity or, is, or at least self-education – needs to be continuous. Yes. Um, I was, a, I was a great coach. I coached myself to a fourth place regional finish. I mean, I, I think that's, I, I don't want to say that I was a great coach. That's not the measure of a great coach, but I was a good coach. I was yeah. good at coaching athletes and I was able to coach myself to a fourth place finish. And I did all the program design for one of my other athletes that was at my gym. Um, and, and he was also a regional qualifier and a top, a top 15 finisher. I, I did a good job, but I still hired Max because I needed outside input. I needed to identify why I struggled so bad with handstand pushups, for yeah. example. For me, I just did more handstand pushups. The result was I built more shoulder mass, right? I built up more shoulder muscle mass and had a harder time delivering blood to that because I was a <laughs> deliver, delivery limited athlete. I just compounded my problem, yeah. right? Well, with working with Max, he identified some movement limitations um, overhead, he identified like my Terry's complex was extremely tight. Didn't let me get into a good overhead position. We opened that up and my strict handstand push up, like AMRAP unbroken went from like 14 to 24 in, in like two weeks, just from changing my position and making it, you, you know, more advantageous from a lever perspective. Yeah. So having someone else who's objective and is vest has a vested interest in your, in your success can be an extremely valuable thing if you're an athlete who wants to be successful in this sport. Yeah, makes good sense. Staying open-minded and listening to other people. Yeah, and making sure that they're that they're very invested in your success as well. Yeah. It's the right people. Yeah, don't don't be the guy in the in the class workout who's coaching everyone else. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you mentioned earlier that Moxie monitor and um i've seen you guys testing quite a lot with it lately how does it work and what is it exactly all right so the the quick science behind it basically it shoots a laser into your muscle and it measures the the for lack of a better way to explain it it measures the color of the muscle tissue which tells you about how much oxygen and how much hemoglobin is in the muscle, the percentage of the muscle that's that's containing oxygen that contains oxygen, yeah. and the percentage of the cells that are carrying the oxygen there. So that tells you a whole bunch of information, right? That tells you number one how quickly you're utilizing the oxygen that you're delivering, right? So that's that's the O2 saturation piece, and then the total hemoglobin tells you how much blood volume is in the tissue at that time. Yeah, and so what you can see is you, you start to get this, this differential where at some athletes deliver more blood. They over-deliver blood, right? But yeah. they can't use all the oxygen. And then you get some athletes that are, use, are sucking the oxygen out of the blood so fast their delivery system can't get it there. And it, it, from, from a most basic standpoint, it is an awesome tool for assessing athletes and determining why they have to stop or why they have to slow down. Yeah. when they're in a, in the middle of a metcon and it's uh the the technology i think is is it it's in its infancy i mean the the moxie technology has been around for a while but you know there's just now two competitors in the market which means that algorithms for analyzing the data are going to get better it means that the the systems are going to get smaller eventually i'm sure we're going to have clothing with moxie technology woven into the fabric where you're just going to have, you know, you'll have your phone and, and all that. So we're just now starting to see this technology catch on, and we're just now starting to see some competition in the market. And I think in the next, it's, it's going to happen fast because we know the pace of, of technological advance always increases. Yeah. I think in the, in the market, you're going to have coaches who know how to use it effectively in the next two years, and you're going to have teams of athletes using it in the next four years probably. There, it seems like there's so many things that we still don't know, especially about the sport of fitness, but also just in general about the body. Like I, I feel like there's there's still so much to learn and so much that we have no idea about that it's just 
it can revolutionize well, the way we think within the well, next 10 years. The, the moxie has completely changed the way that I know I understand, and I think eventually it will change the way the majority of people who are involved in, in sport understand what's going on in the body. So what we used to say is, is that we had anaerobically powerful athletes and aerobically powerful athletes, right? Yeah. We had our strength and, and power guys and our, and our enduros. But the reality is that the guys that, are, that we used to classify as anaerobically powerful, they're actually just really good at using oxygen, which means that they're aerobically powerful. And yeah. so they suck up all that oxygen really quickly and then start to produce lactate. It's not that they are better at producing lactate. They're just better at using oxygen. So it's completely flipped the model um, you know, that, that our, our paradigm for, for exercise physiology has completely flipped it. I've got a master's in ex-phys that I finished in 2008, and it's yeah. completely flipped since then. <laughs> yeah. So you really got to stay updated with the new books. Yeah, well, this stu- I'm not even sure that this stuff is in books at this point. This is a lot. This is stuff that's coming straight out of journals. And oh, wow. I thank Evan for I, th- I thank Evan for constantly. I mean, this dude is constantly reading, and he's always challenging my my worldview. He challenges Max Max's worldview, um, and just our understanding of of the sport and the, our understanding of what's going on inside the body. Yeah. It seems like you guys over at the training think tank have such a cool environment like how many coaches are you we just hired some new coaches ryan and mia um i think we're i think we're eight coaches i'm not going to go through and count them uh to take the time to go through all the names and count them. i think we're eight coaches or nine right. coaches at this point up from max and i only four years ago then adam rogers uh you know three and a half years ago to adding brandon dorman Two years ago, then Evan and Kyle, yeah, and then Mike and Brandy, yeah. I mean, it was like pop, 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 um, and the growth has been really has been really cool. Max and I, when when Max started this and and I started with him, it was we didn't have a website, we were just word of mouth. Then we started our blog and we started to get a little more uptick, and you know that that period of time was tough. Yeah, we alternated writing a blog every week. I that's how I got to Max, know you guys. By the block. Yeah, like, we did that. We did that for, well, I think, two years, alternating writing blogs every every week. And this is not some short, easy read blocks. Like, if you want to go to their site and read their blogs, you better have like a good cup of coffee next to you and hundred percent focus. Because <laughs> those articles were the ones that blew me away. And I remember I was like telling my uh, my co-host Marcus who, who wasn't able to be here today like we need to get these guys on the show like they know what's going on well i'm not sure that it's that i could ever say that i know what's going on <laughs> but i know that i have a better idea of what's going on <laughs> let's put than i way. did a year ago i'll put it that way let me let me let's put it this way you guys are chasing you're in the pursuit of knowing what's going on and not just sitting still thinking you know everything. That's what's yeah. I think that yeah. what well, determines you know the the best out there. I don't know if it's me getting older, if just like you, you know being in my my early thirties has changed my perspective. But I've realized that most of the things that I have learned in my life and knew a hundred percent, I was a hundred percent sure that it was accurate. I have come to learn were wrong, <laughs> and so I'm never going to to say that I know anything with certainty, but with that being said, um, I'm, I'm always going to pursue upgrading my, my knowledge base and, yeah. and whether that's reading or, you know, working with athletes, investigating, talking to you about how things feel yeah. about, you know, rates of progress, keeping track of how athletes are, are progressing. Um, it just, I, I feel like I'm constantly searching for, for a better path. Yeah. I, uh, I was at a course three, four months, three, four months ago with a, with a kind of movement specialist, and he kind of ended the course saying, "The more you learn, the less you know," which kind of yes. sums up what you just said. Like, the more we just figure, read, and and study, the more we learn that there's so many things that we don't know, and you can only basically make assumptions based on the test you've run. But you can never say that, you know, this is exactly because of that or this. 
unless you know there's never a there's, final answer there there's too much there's too much complexity involved in the human body to ever know with certainty what caused what yeah right so I mean, if, if you think about it, and we talk about this all the time, about how we have no idea what's going on. So, so, so along these lines, your, the way that you breathe impacts your posture, and your posture determines a bit of, of your nervous system state, whether you're in like an autonomic um, like fight or flight state or an autonomic re- rest and digest state. Yeah. And – the, the state of your nervous system comes back and influences your muscle tension and your muscle tension determines how much, um, it, you know, comes back and circles back to your posture, which determines how you're breathing. So it's all just this big interconnected circle and all of that, how you're breathing and your posture and your nervous system state at rest determines how well you're recovering from your training program. Yeah. It's just so it's, there's so much complexity that for us to say that we know for, for certain, that doing protocol X is going to result in Y, I, I think that's that's kind of that's kind of crazy. But on the other hand, what you do is as you learn more, you start to increase your your t- toolbox and you start to have s- systems or tools that you that you are more certain will have the desired outcome. Yeah. Um, and the more people you test them with, the more reliable you start to see start to see the results and and uh, I think that's part of what what good coaches are. Good coaches are people that have big toolboxes and a really wide range of experience to know how to apply the right tool at the right time. Yeah, they recognize patterns or have created patterns, sort of. I remember one of the first things you had me do. Absolutely. I, one of the first thing you had me do that was that was quite funny when when I started the program was like all these breathing exercises, all these sort of Wim Hof inspired stuff can you talk to us a little bit about like how improving briefing mechanics or if briefing mechanics is a general limiter for crossfitters and basically how we can develop it it's just you don't have to go into super super deep into this topic just a little bit superficial i i I will just i'm going to start with an example all right we're going to take our clone of you again except this time with you we're going to do breathing exercises to increase uh, the, the flexibility of your, of your lower ribs and the flexibility of your diaphragm. All right. So Andre can, can ventilate, let's just say five liters of oxygen per, per breath. And, uh, your clone can, can ventilate three liters of oxygen per breath. And we multiply that. You guys are taking, you know, let's say 60 breaths in a minute in the middle of a workout. So you're 60 times five, your clone is 60 times three. Who's going to breathe in more oxygen? That's you, amazing. obviously. Who's going to who's going to win the event? Easy. The person who ventilates more oxygen. If you take more in, you can use more. Therefore, yeah. you can generate more power. Um, so yes, breathing mechanics is is a major factor in this sport, and and I think the um, there's there's a bunch of different layers of this that I look at. And again, they're all it's not black and white. It's all gray. But uh, I think number one is is learning to have optimal breathing mechanics at rest because you're you're not training most of the day, right? So yeah. in twenty four hours you might train you might train four or six, but the rest of the day you're not training. So if you have poor breathing mechanics, it's going to impact uh, your autonomic nervous system. So it might put you in a fight or flight state because that's one of the things that breathing can do, or it might put you uh, it might change your blood chemistry so that you have more or less CO2 in the blood, which has all kinds of impacts on the body. All right, so breathing mechanics at rest are a big factor. They are, breathing mechanics during exercise are a factor. And here's the, the complicated part about breathing mechanics during exercise, is that you will probably have particular movements that you can breathe well in and other movements that you can't breathe well in. Yeah. And identifying the, which movements athletes breathe well in and which they don't breathe well in is an important piece of correcting it. So if like, if you don't breathe well in the bottom of a squat and you're doing thrusters in a workout like 17.5 and you're at really high respiration rates and you need to breathe in the bottom of the squat, but you can't do it because you know, you're using your diaphragm to stabilize your, your upper chest. 
you're not going to be able to perform. At some point when that respiration rate gets high enough, you're going to, your performance is going to fall off because you can't breathe enough oxygen to, to keep moving at the pace you are. Yeah. So within, so, so there's like breathing mechanics at rest. They're important. Breathing mechanics during a movement. They're very important, particularly in a sport like CrossFit where it's multiple, you know, you know tons and tons of different, different movements and, um, high respiration rates with all those different movements. And then I, I think the other thing is, you know, with breathing techniques like Wim Hof or relaxation breathing, yeah. it's learning to either ramp yourself up for a session or learning to immediately turn it off. This is something that Max has talked about a lot after, you know, he's, he's observed the athletes in the back at the CrossFit Games for, for you know, three or four years now. Yeah. And the guys that are most successful, guys like Frazier, guys like Fikowski, they go out, they get ramped up, but as soon as they're back in the athlete village, you can see that they go into a parasympathetic state. They, you know, there's relaxation on, on their face. They're, the tension's out of their face. The tension's out of their traps. They're laying down. They almost are like not asleep but on the verge of asleep. And yeah. they, they flip the switch from on to off really quickly. Well, That's the whether itself. or not they intentionally – yes, whether or not they intentionally learn to do that by affecting their breathing or if it was just something that they did naturally – because they had good breathing mechanics at rest, it doesn't matter how, why it happened. We just know that that's an important factor in being successful in a sport like CrossFit where there's multiple events in the day. So in the end, yes, breathing mechanics are extremely important for this sport. And again, I think a good coach is going to have lots of different tools to impact breathing mechanics, yeah. whether it's smashing out the diaphragm um, to – if you find an athlete with too much tension through, through, you know, the abdominals or teaching someone to actually use their lower ribs to breathe rather than their, their upper chest and lifting their shoulders, which is super typical, right? Putting, yes. That's, I mean, that's the most common. And the, the longer someone spins in this sport, the, the more time they spend, the worse that pattern gets developed. Um, which, which can cause a host of other issues, especially, you know, some postural, um, some, some postural de de deterioration over time. Yeah. Um, so, so looking at it like, yeah, all of those components are important and you just want to have as many tools in your toolbox to impact it as possible and then select the right tool for the right time. It, it sounds like we could do a pure podcast and just briefing. I would love to do that. I spent, um, basically from like November last year through, through the open this year. Um, reading literally everything that I could get my hands on regarding breathing. I, I took a breathing course. Uh, I took two breathing courses, the FMS breathing course and then this optimal breathing course as well um, and, and just dug into it as much as I could to, to learn as much about it as I could. Man, when I first started getting into it, my, like for example, my running improved without running. So I would like go for a run and then I wouldn't run for two weeks and I'd go run again, same course. And time it, and I would be faster, and all I was doing was improve, improving my breathing mechanics. And it just kept feeling like I could get more and more oxygen every time. What, what is one basic thing that people out there could start doing to improve their breathing mechanics? Just one simple exercise that could be done, I don't know, three times a week to improve their overall fitness and breathing mechanic. Su super simple. I would always start with uh, breathing mechanics at rest. So lie flat on your back, prop your feet up on a bench or your bed or something like that. So your legs are kind of, you know, your hips and legs are at 90, 90 and put, fold your hands across your stomach so you can feel your diaphragm expand and then just focus on the sequence of breathing. So when you inhale, your diaphragm should expand. So you should feel your, your belly rise. Yeah. Then your lower ribs. So like the lower rib cage that kind of hugs your, your stomach You should feel those expand. Most people can't expand those very well. Then you should then on the exhale, your ribs should pull back in. Then the diaphragm should lower. Okay. And just learning to breathe with that sequence can make a massive difference. And and you know I would do 10 breaths to 15 breaths and do two or three cycles of that. That way people are starting to learn how to breathe optimally. The first step in changing it is being aware that there's probably a broken or dysfunctional pattern. And most people, when they do that drill, will find that they don't even know how to sequence their breathing. Yeah. So, so it's basically the optimal breathing happens through pulling your, expanding your, your stomach by pulling your diaphragm down and not by expanding yep. your chest. Correct. Well, But, both yeah. happen. 
Okay. So optimal breathing. So again, here's this, uh, everything is a gradient thing, but optimal breathing basically works like this. It should be at rest diaphragm first, low ribs, then on the exhale, low ribs, then diaphragm. Okay. Yeah. So three, three cycles of 15 breaths, three times a week. Yep. And, and it's, it's way easier in that position, in that position where you're lying on your back with your feet propped up, it's way easier. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that you do is as, if you want to progress this, you take people and you start them on their back, do that for a couple of weeks, then go into a quadruped, you know, hands and knees position. Yeah. Um, work there, then go into a half kneeling position and then do it from standing and then doing it from, you know, standing and twisting and starting to add, add complexity to the position that you're breathing in. Yeah. Right. And that way people are starting to, to understand that like as, as they're walking around, their breathing pattern should pretty much be the same as when they're lying flat on their back. It's just a lot easier to do when you're lying flat on your back. Yeah. I, um, unfortunately we don't have that much time left for, for the show. So I definitely think that we should get you back for another time and, um, and really dig deep into this briefing. Cause I definitely think there's so much more to learn. Also like super interested in learning about the recovery part of it and, and how like that will impact, you know, your whole life in CrossFit, outside of CrossFit and everything. In the, in the meantime, if, if the listeners, if they want to go, uh, I wrote a really extensive blog. It might be the longest blog I've ever written on the training think tank. I have read that blog, one. uh, on breathing. Yeah. It's, it's entirely revolves around improving breathing mechanics using, you know, relaxation breathing techniques and how to use breathing for, for training, how to actually impact breathing with training. I, I got some videos and stuff in there. Check that one out. Yeah. Um, it will give you a primer and then next time, you know, we, maybe we can expand on some of the topics in that. I, I don't know. We'll, I'll, I'll let you run the show and, and I'll just talk about whatever you want me to talk yeah, about. Yeah, that'd be cool. We, um, it's been an awesome show. We, we always finish off our shows by asking our guests if they have one piece of advice for our listeners that have been given or learned throughout their life. If you have one, what would that be? Gosh. All right. So there's, I, I want to give two pieces of advice, but, uh, I think the lesson that I've learned most recently, um, and this has just been in my transition from athlete to, you know, full-time athlete to full-time coach. And Max told me about this years ago, but I didn't listen, which is a common theme in my life. So maybe my piece of advice should just be to people listen. should listen. Yeah. Um, so there, no, there's, there it is. My, my piece of advice. No, uh, you need to have something outside of your competitive identity because at some point you're going to set your last PR. Yeah. And at some point you're not going to be able to compete with the guys that are 25 and 26 and 27. It's just inevitable. So don't rest your identity on your physical performance because physical performance eventually does go away. Yeah. On the, on the flip side, when you are young, and you have this massive ceiling, attack it with everything that you, that you have because eventually it will be gone. Yeah. Safe. At 26 or 27 or 28, you are approaching as good as you will ever be. Your, yeah. your potential is as high as, as it can possibly be. You can preserve that into your 30s, but the, the reality is that uh, – um, once, once you reach your early 30s, you can just see it at the CrossFit Games by the, by the ages. Um, those guys are starting to fade. So number one, cultivate things outside of physical culture. Yeah. Develop yourself as a coach. Develop yourself as a friend. Develop yourself as a um, – whatever, whatever it is outside. Um, just make sure that you have something outside of the sport so that when you are done competing and, and competing doesn't take up your entire life um, – that you have good stuff to to do, yeah. Because it, it it's a tough it's a tough transition period. I can tell you that when you go from training five or six hours a day to what do I do with all this time and yeah. and you use your training use your training as a as a reason to wake up early and a, a reason to you know get your work done yeah. timely and all that stuff and then all of a sudden you don't have that and it's it, it's a tough transition. But on the flip side, when you're young, take advantage of all of it. 
I think that was two really good advice, and I, I definitely think that a lot of people could use both, and especially the first one with having something outside of the sport, this new sport that there's not really any money in or like a super, super long career. So really make sure that you have something else that is going well for you, whether it's, you know, being in a great relationship or having pursuing a career in, in a job or education or whatever it is. But take advantage of your youth. It's a, yeah. it's one of the most valuable assets that you have. And it is now or never. Yeah. And it's always underappreciated. Yeah. <laughs> That I, from from my own personal experience, it, it was vastly underappreciated. <laughs> I can imagine. How do people get in touch with you if they want programming, if they want to, you know, hit up the courses well, or just shoot you a message? I know your Instagram is so, right, very, very dead. <laughs> hey, I've been doing a better job recently. Um, okay, so <laughs> we'll start with this. We'll start with if, if they want to contact me, I'm happy to answer questions. My email address is just kyle.ruth at trainingthinktank.com. Um, a lot of times if you send me a question, it may take me a while to get back to you because um, I've, I've got this this gaggle of athletes that I'm trying to turn into elite warriors. Yeah. Um, but I, I will get back to you at some point. Um, if, if people are interested in coaching with Training Think Tank, just go to our website and fill out our Get Started form. That gets you into the pipeline. Uh, at this point, all of our coaches, with the exception of our two newest, um, have wait lists. We've, we just have a limited capacity to coach athletes. Um, as you know, the amount of time that we invest into each athlete is, yeah. is pretty extraordinary. So we all keep, you know, we all keep caps. It's for, for me, this is not about making as much money as possible. This is about making athletes as good as possible and investing into them and, and making them the best version of themselves. So I keep a cap, you know, max is capped. All of our coaches are, are capped at yeah. this point, with the exception of our two newest, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't get on the wait list. No. Um, I think, you, you know, you waited on a wait list. It's worth it. I know. I, I was so surprised. I was so excited to just finish the open, ride training, think tank, hey, I want to do a program. The answer back. Um, yeah, we'll be able to sign you up in a couple of months. I'm like, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're like, no, no, but... But I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm really like, good. <laughs> I'm pretty good. Yeah, we like, know. Please. <laughs> we know you're still on the wait list. <laughs> yeah, you'll still wait two months. You're like, uh, all right. Well, <laughs> it's that. It was definitely worth the wait. So if you're out there wanting to, you know, get in touch, just be patient. It's definitely worth it. Like the feedback, daily feedback, the programming, the, you know, just the, the work with you coach my relationship with you it's 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 really cool so i definitely recommend anyone signing and you up you guys are, are uh, you guys are all more than welcome to follow my instagram it's just kyle ruth underscore cf um i'm gonna be doing a better job of, of posting some stuff on there but in in reality you guys should follow the training think tank instagram because that's where the that's where the magic happens right yeah there. you guys have been real aggressive on that one lately well, we, we hired CTP, formerly of uh, Barbell Shrugged, and he is so good at what he does. Yeah. You guys so good. You have your own podcast as well and everything, so so much content out there, definitely. So hit the blog, hit the podcast, hit their Instagram. If you want to get in touch, don't go to Cal's Instagram unless you really <laughs> start stepping up your game. I'm working on it, all right? Okay, sounds good. Hey, can I can, can I hire you to, to do my Instagram stories for me? <laughs> I, I don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, mate. Thank you so much for, for a great show. We uh, will definitely need to get you back on the show sometime to talk about the briefing or whatever comes to mind because there's so much out there that we, we still need to assess. It's been a yeah, pleasure. We got to talk about we got to talk about nutrition and CrossFit next time. That's one thing we definitely got to talk about. Yes. Hey, I really appreciate you having me on the show, Andre. It, it was a pleasure. It really was. Cool, Excited man. Excited to do another one, man. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely get you on very soon. All right. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'll see you guys soon. Thanks a lot for tuning into this episode of the podcast, folks. Do hope you've enjoyed it. Some super useful insights there from Kyle and. As I said at the end, I think we should definitely get him back on. He's pretty good at talking, but he's got a lot to share. 
If you want to speak to us, winning at innerfight.com is where you can find us. Ask us any questions you want. Or if you've got an idea for someone to come on the show, just drop us an email. Let us know. We'd love to have people on the show. And we'd love to answer your questions. Until next time, thanks for tuning in. Take care.